Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. April 4th marked the 50th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. Several events were held across the country to commemorate this somber moment in our history. Here in Detroit, the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History hosted a lecture focusing on the controversy surrounding Dr. King's murder. Information contained in a book titled The Plot to Kill King, The Truth Behind the Assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. alleges that James Earl Ray was innocent and Dr. King's death was the result of a government conspiracy. The book's author spoke at the museum event and I'm pleased to have him here. Today I'd like to welcome William Pepper, former attorney for the King family. Also here is social justice and civil rights attorney Carl Edwards, who moderated the program at the right. Welcome both of you to American Black Journal. Thank Happy you. to be here. Yeah. So I, I want to start with you uh, and, and talk about the surprise that I think a lot of people who are watching might have at the idea behind your book, the idea that James Earl Ray did not kill Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and that there was a government plot uh, that, that did that. In, in the sort of simplest terms, explain how you come to that conclusion. Well, I've had the um, good fortune or misfortune to spend over 40 years uh, <laughs> looking into this case mm -hmm. because uh, I came to know Martin King the last year of his life and we became uh, quite close. So I, it was a slippery slope once I got started on this, but uh, it took me 10 years of uh, initial investigation before I, I came to the conclusion that James O. Ray was only, not only the, not the shooter, but that he was an unknowing patsy. And uh, so from 1988 till he died in 1998, I represented James and tried to get him a trial, and I failed. Uh -huh. and, and this was something that he asserted as well? James initially pleaded guilty. Right. He, he had been talked into changing lawyers, and his lawyer conned him into believing he was going to get a trial and then went the other way and eventually told James he couldn't defend him properly because uh, he, had a, he had a problem with his health. Yeah. And, and he offered James $500 if he would plead guilty, put that in writing, which copy of which we have, mm -hmm and uh, gave that $500 to his brother and said, James, you plead guilty, cause no problems at the guilty plea hearing, and uh, you, you can then get, use the $500, get a new lawyer, overturn the, uh, the guilty plea, and get your trial, which, of course, never happened. Yeah. Uh, when we think of famous assassinations, and especially famous or notable ass assassinations of the 1960s, uh, John Kennedy... Robert Kennedy, we've seen these kind of theories crop up around those killings as well. Is it, your, uh, is it your theory that these are all related conspiracies? Well, I, I haven't looked heavily into any of the other conspiracies except <clears throat> the Robert Kennedy one. Mm -hmm. I also represent Sirhan. But it's only based on evidence and factual evidence mm -hmm. that I've come to these conclusions. It's not a theory. Right. We have, we have uh, depositional wi witness uh, evidence. We had a, a trial in the case of the King mm -hmm. the assassination. We tried a case for 30 days with 70 witnesses. Yeah. That was in 1999. Uh -huh. And 16 years uh, after that, we then have a, un uncovered a, a very powerful amount of facts that show that James was innocent and that, in fact, it was a government operation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and you want to sort of step back and put these, these events in, in some context. Uh, the, the government was very worried about uh, what Martin Luther King Jr. was doing. Uh, for, through, for most of his professional career, they had become particularly worried by the late 1960s, by the change in his work and the change in the focus. Yes, Stephen. Um, you know, I look through... Dr. Pepper's book, especially the last one, um, The Plot to Kill King, mm -hmm. through a legal lens, mm -hmm. obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I do a fair amount of appellate work, which means brief work. Right. I love doing it. And for me, the test is the evidence. Not only has Dr. Pepper amassed a considerable body of what we call circumstantial evidence, mm -hmm. but he has also developed a considerable body of direct evidence mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the form of the son, um, Ron um, Atkins, of the father, Russell Atkins, where the assassination was planned at the home. So 
Dr. Pepper has accumulated not only direct evidence through the testimony of the son mm -hmm. that the murder was planned at, the, at his father and the family home, but the connection between Clyde Tolson, who was the number two man in the FBI next to J. Edgar Hoover, uh, organized crime figures who were present in the home. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Dixie Mafia, which was headed by his father, Russell, uh, the local chief of police, uh, Holloman, as well as the mayor, they were all in the family home plotting the Talking murder. about That's right, the, what they were going to do. what they were going to do. That's right, and who was going to do it and who was involved. So, uh, you know, as Dr. Pepper says, we, we look at evidence, we look at facts. Mm -hmm. This is not speculation now. And for me, when I see the deposition of a 16-year-old son who was present, who was involved in and at the planning of the assassination, uh, it leads to a very strong conclusion that the FBI and the federal government, the mafia, the Dixie Mafia, which is the Ku Klux Klan, sure, sure. Uh, the mayor and others were involved in the assassination of this great man. Yeah, Talk about the difficulty you've had getting this into sort of popular acceptance. Uh, you, as you say, you've spent a long time working on this and amassed all of this evidence. How come, how come people are not uh, popularly uh, sort of r repeating this as, as fact? Well, because the corporate mainstream media has decided to suppress the, uh, the, the truth and the evidence that has been uncovered. Not only with respect uh, to this case, as Carl has succinctly said, but uh, with respect to the other assassinations as well. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the mass of Americans have never been allowed to, to see this evidence, to hear this evidence. It has never been allowed uh, to be heard in court under an evidentiary hearing or, or, or a trial. So it's been very difficult for the American public to, uh, to understand this, what, uh... what, what this is all about. And uh, government uh, apologists continue to, to call this kind of, uh, of, of opposition to the official position, uh, oh, conspiracy theorists, that's all they are. Right. And just dismiss all what, what, <laughs> what, what Carla said, all the evidence and the hard facts that have, uh, yeah. have emerged. He was talking about the meetings that took place uh, where this was, yes. was planned. Uh, talk about some of the other evidence that for you is just uh, there's a sort of overwhelming proof that, that this was a conspiracy and not... Uh, well, uh, J. Edgar Hoover sent his number two, Clyde Tolson, as, uh, as Carl mentioned, into, into Memphis on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. He came in with money to pay off informants and actors and instructions as to w what the steps should be. For example, James Earl Ray never knew it, but his escape from prison was arranged with, with $25,000 that Tolson brought in and gave to Russell Atkins, who drove to the prison with the son, Ronnie, that Carl mentioned, to deliver that $25,000 to Warden Swenson to arrange for the escape of James O'Reilly, oh, because they had profiled him as an, as an excellent con if he was uh, out, out, out on the streets, whom they could manipulate and they could use as a patsy. Mm -hmm. So that money was taken to Swenson, given to him, and sure enough, James Earl Ray was allowed to escape from prison. Yeah. I mean, that's a hard fact. Eyewitness, the son was a, uh, an eyewitness to that, the delivery of those, of those funds. Uh -huh. As was he told to call Clyde Tolson Uncle Clyde, who became very close to his, uh, to his, uh, his father and the family. Mm -hmm. but, uh, what sort of things did James Earl Ray say to you uh, later in his life about how all this happened and how he felt about it? Well, James felt very badly that he was used this way, but he, be, he became, only became aware of being handled and manipulated by a handler called Raul, whom we discovered, we found, where he lived, had him under surveillance, so there was no question that, that we had the right guy. But James was, in many ways, was ashamed that he had been so used and so conned and told Dexter King when Dexter King asked him, uh, did you kill my father? And James quite rightly said, no, I, I didn't do it, and that's what he maintained throughout. Mm -hmm. And he only identified Raul uh, one time from a, a set of six photographs. He didn't, he was shown hundreds of other photographs. He never identified he never Raul. Identified but the, the, from this one set of six that we developed, 
he was able to identify the man we came to know as his handler, Raoul. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what are we to draw from this 50 years later? What lesson do you feel uh, we're supposed to be taking from not just what happened, but this this uh, this story that that has not really gotten the the light of day. Uh, excellent question, Stephen. Uh, for me, it's two takeaways. Uh, both as an attorney, as an American citizen, fiercely loyal to this country, and believes passionately in the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. Um, the King family, Mrs. Mm -hmm. King, Coretta Scott King, all embrace uh, Dr. Pepper's findings. Secondly. How can, you, how can you pinpoint an assassin when the bullet which they had from Dr. King's death doesn't match the gun? The gun. Mm -hmm. I mean, how can, how, can, how can you then go with the fiction that he's the killer, mm -hmm. since you're saying this was the weapon that he dropped and, the, and, the, and it doesn't match? Secondly, they tested the, the rifle, and if I was aiming at you at this distance, I couldn't hit you with it. It was that off. And so the lesson is, is that when there are great people and persons who are placed in our midst that want to take this country on the road that Dr. King wanted to take us, mm -hmm. and that road is very clear, mm -hmm. brotherhood, mm -hmm. sisterhood. He wanted black kids and white kids to play together. He wanted the scourge of slavery and Jim Crow left from the American landscape. And importantly, he wanted uh, the sort of economic interest, the common economic interest right. of poor people That's right. of all hues That's to, right. be, uh, to be fought together. So clearly there are very vast and powerful forces that don't want that agenda. Yeah. And that's the lesson. Okay. Thank you both for being here. Great, uh, great to meet you and uh, talk about your work. You're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Sure. Thank you, Stephen. Mm -hmm.